yesterday when we saw Roger Hill. Do you want me up on the podium? Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that Manchester Day was actually the, the first year that Tier 1 was out. And we actually cut Roger Hill off to get to that. And I want to apologize for that because it's, it's weighed on me since. Roger, sorry. Also, uh, housekeeping notes I found these glasses in the men's bathroom with a compromising note on them. <laughs> They're eye dogs, so if you want your glasses back, they'll be right up here, and while I'm talking, you can just come up and get them. <laughs> All right, so, I actually grew up um, uh, the son of an IMAX filmmaker. So, at a very early age, you know, that was kind of imprinted upon me, and what you did in life, is that you took this this large IMAX camera weighs 92 pounds, and you take it to interesting places, and you worry about it breaking down, because it was always breaking down. And you, you tried to film, um, you know, nature, um, and, and bring those, those amazing images back to a larger audience. So e even at a young age, you know, when I was 11 or 12, I, my father would take his family, if he had an extended film trip, to like the Galapagos Islands or the Great Barrier Reef. And so I was very fortunate, you know, even though one of my jobs was to guard the equipment, I'd sit on the cases and guard the equipment. That was kind of my first job. Um, I, I, I had this impression upon that's what you do in life, is that you go out with a camera and you go get images. And as I grew up, um, I got into film, of course, and got into the IMAX format, and I, I kind of worked my way up from being the guy that carries the cases to being the sound man on a, a film we did on Great White Sharks. Um, then we did a film on Africa, the Serengeti. I don't know if anybody's seen it. Anybody? Yeah. Oh, she did, my wife did. <laughs> yeah. um, and I was the second unit cameraman on that. And then we did a film on uh, Alaska, Spirit of the Wild. And I was, again, the second unit cameraman. And then we did a film called Amazing Journeys about migrating animals. And that's when it all started. We were filming on this little island called Christmas Island in the Indian Ocean. And we were filming these red crabs that every monsoonal, um, when they'd have their monsoon season, these crabs would migrate from the jungle interior on this very tiny island, and they'd migrate down to the ocean to deposit their eggs into the Indian Ocean, and those eggs would kind of float off. These are the red crabs, 120 million of them. And so they'd go down to the ocean, and they'd do this little dance, they'd deposit their eggs, uh, and they would go off in, in, into the ocean. And they were supposed to come back in about two, three weeks. And for some reason, this season, they were delayed. And it's expensive, of course, to have a uh, film crew in the field, so um, I volunteered to be kind of left behind um, on this little island, Christmas Island. And this is what I was supposed to film. It was going to be this orange carpet of, of these little baby crabs, tiny little things just coming out of the ocean onto these volcanic cliffs and return back into the jungle. And the issue was they weren't coming back, so I was waiting, you know, week after week, and I was, I was slowly, you know, the, the Island fever, you guys, anybody had an island fever? Were you going insane? <laughs> no? Um, I was going insane. And I was going to this library and checking out these books, and one of the books that I checked out was Storm Chasing, the, this book here. And it wasn't the kind of island fever. <laughs> oh, wait, wait, I was going to have a safe word. There's some kids in the audience. So the safe word was going to be something like rainbows. And so when I say rainbows, then you cover your child's eyes. So rainbows. <laughs> a little late, a little late. So the island fever I was uh, inflicted with wasn't this type of island fever. It was this kind of island fever. <laughs> Something about wearing coconuts and laying on the beach. Um, of course, the little baby crabs finally came back. And I filmed them actually on Christmas Day, on Christmas Island. There's a song about that. And I left the island. 
<laughs> so the first thing when I got back to the United States, of course, you know, I, that the idea of storm chasing, you know, that's that that kind of in my mind um, when I was having on fever, the idea of having a, a road trip and going across the United States chasing these 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 storms, it was a extraordinarily appealing to me. So the minute I got back to the United States, I called Dr. Josh Werman, because I'd done this internet research. And he seemed to be a scientist that was in the field. He was very active. He had these radar trucks. And so when I called him, I said, hi. You know, I cold called him. I said, hi, my name is Sean Casey. I have an IMAX camera. Can I come and film you? <laughs> and of course, like the IMAX camera is like some golden ticket. You know, you can call anybody and say, I have an IMAX camera, can I come along? And they go, yeah. Hey, Eminem, can I come out and hang out with you? Got an IMAX camera. <laughs> so that's, oh, we'll just leave it here. But um, well, I'm gonna be tag teaming with uh, Brandon Ivy. And so that's how I got involved with storm chasing. Um, it was uh, being on a little island and getting island fever and just calling up a scientist and going out for the first year. And I fell in love with it. The first chase that I went on, I mean, I fell, I fell head over heels in love with the environment. Because I'm from Los Angeles, and you know, the storm systems we have, you know, you get the rain, you get mudslides, um, you, you rarely get any type of lightning or thunder, of course. And so, all of a sudden, being in this environment where the skies become alive with all that power and that violence, and as a filmmaker going underneath these supercells, these mountain-sized objects that you're going underneath and you're, you're being immersed in all that power, I mean, I fell in love with it. So now I'm going to hand it off to Brandon, and he's going to talk about how he fell in love <laughs> with tomatoes. <laughs> So violent, you know, basically out of water vapor and wind shear. And that, that was a real unique thing to me. And I remember that season in 1991, obviously I was young, but it seemed like it was all almost a weekly routine that you'd come home, you'd be home from school for about 30 minutes, an hour. And it probably wasn't every week, but it just seemed like that as a kid that, you know, for 30 minutes, an hour, we'd spend the evening down in the basement because the tornado sirens would be going off. And, you know, obviously tornadoes were coming down south of Wichita. Um, but they, still to this day, I believe they have the whole county set up on the, on the same system of sirens. So once they set the sirens off, you know, the whole county goes off. They, you know, can't selectively set off sirens except for some of the smaller communities that have kind of gone away from that. So in going into the presentation, and uh, it was kind of cool, I found these little bullets in the PowerPoint, I was kind of proud of that. Um, you know, obviously, I became interested in severe weather just growing up in Wichita. It was just kind of became a natural fascination. Uh, once the state of Kansas was good enough to grace me with a driver's license, uh, I was pretty much out. Um, didn't have a lot of experience under my belt. Obviously, I didn't know anything about forecasting. Back then, I'd take a scanner out, take the Kansas Gazetteer out. I usually didn't stray too far away from home, uh, but I remember even at the age of 16, uh, my parents, they'd always make me take a cell phone with them, my dad's cell phone, and I had to call in and check in about every 30 minutes. And probably the most knowledge I had, I'd have to give credit to Tim Marshall. Uh, a lot of my birthdays and Christmas presents were either ordering his VHS tapes or his books that I still have to this day. And uh, watching the uh, events of 1991, those Kansas tornado chases, 
you know, pretty amazing VHS that, you know, VHS tape, so that's the only reason I still have a VHS player. I need to upgrade to some DVDs. Um, <laughs> but uh, just seeing those events that kind of drew my interest, you know, that, that was kind of a, an amazing year. Um, and so I started going out and chasing at the age of 16 when I was a junior in high school. Uh, my first tornado was uh, May the 25th of 1997. Um, obviously, I chased a northern storm. I didn't go down to the Wellington storm. Uh, I saw a brief tornado up by Burton, Kansas. And back then, I didn't know, hey, pick the southern storm. That's going to rob the fuel if it's, you know, there's not enough spacing in between the storms. But nine times out of ten, that happened. Um, and then when I started going to college, I wasn't real motivated to go to college right after high school. Um, I had better things to do, obviously, at that age. Uh, but I started working in aircraft in Wichita, and they paid for tuition, so I was like, well, I'll go back to school and try it. And really, the only thing I had an interest in getting a degree in was uh, meteorology. And you know, I was enrolled in OU and, and should have went that route, but I completed a broadcast meteorology degree through Mississippi State and finished that in 2006. Um, had enough general ed classes that, you know, I also got the bachelor's degree through them. And then basically I started working with Sean in 2009. It was just kind of a, a luck deal. You know, Sean was needing some help and, um, you know, just through the right people, um, that opportunity came open. And I've been working with him basically ever since 2009, the last three seasons. And we've had some successful chases together. And with that, I'll turn that back over to him. Okay. All right, back to this image. So this is what we kind of looked like when we first started chasing in 1999. Um, we didn't have, of course, a tank back then, right? Um, you're, we were just getting our feet wet, so to speak. And, and usually we'd have a truck or we'd, we'd rent minivans, right? And there's a good thing about Enterprise is that if you return a vehicle after hours, from storm chasing, you just drop, you park and you drop the keys in the little drop box and you get on your plane and go home. <laughs> you can leave a note if you like to. Uh, so in chasing back then, when in this minivan, you'd have to actually, you know, if you saw something you wanted to film, you'd have to jump out, of course stop the vehicle, you'd jump out, put your sticks down, then you'd put your 92 pound camera on top of those sticks and then you'd plug in your battery system and then you'd be leveling your camera. And the whole thing took usually, you know, about a minute and a half. And of course you guys know, I mean, you guys all just stick your little cameras out the windows, right? <laughs> you guys are lucky. Uh, with the big camera, it took a minute and a half and usually whatever you saw, because you know it's a fast moving fluid environment out there, usually it was gone. Um, and so we missed a lot of shots, of course. And of course, the shots that we were getting, there's only so close you want to stay um, next to a tornado when it's coming at you when you have a minivan. Um, there's a time when you have to leave. And of course, being new to chasing, you know, we'd probably leave a little prematurely. Um, on, on actually this day, uh, we didn't. Um, but that's another story. We actually, I don't know if anybody saw the video of us locking ourselves out of our minivan. <laughs> Maybe, maybe, yeah, it's, 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 it's compelling footage for building your own TIV, right? Um, so we would have to duck out of there, usually in a timely fashion, and those were the moments when you desperately wanted to stay, you know, to film those last couple of minutes when that tornado was bearing down at you. Because there's a huge difference, of course, between being a mile away from a tornado and using a telephoto lens and then being right next to them. And, of course, this is what we, I don't know, maybe someone here took this image. I've used it without your permission, sorry. <laughs> but this is the image that we wanted to get and we weren't getting it. Um, and so, of course, in this one hotel in Iowa in 2001, while I was going to the bathroom late at night, I had the idea to build this. This idea was that you would have a hemisphere with a camera person inside, you'd kind of lift it off the back of a truck, you'd plant it down, you'd maybe hammer it in or something, and then leave the guy there, probably me, and drive off. And then that person in this would film the tornado coming at you. 
That's actually the real picture. <laughs> um, of course, after an hour of reflection and a couple of beers, the idea, of course, was to build something that was mobile, to have a platform that you could film from, that you could move and adjust and, 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 and get the images. Um, and of course, this is what can happen to vehicles, of course, out there. So the idea was this. This is also one of my schematics. <laughs> and an order, has anybody eaten at In-N-Out Burgers? Yeah. yeah. That was our order that one day. Um, <laughs> I like root beer. So this was building the vehicle um, to actually, and I didn't have any funds at the time, you know? When, when you go to somebody that has money and you say, hi, I'd like to make an IMAX film on tornadoes, I'm gonna build this tank and drive into them, they're polite. And they nod a lot, but that's about it. So initially, I, 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 you know, this was all out of pocket. Um, I had to buy a used Ford 450. It had 114,000 miles on it. I, I learned how to weld and fabricate and, and build TIV-1. And I don't know if you ever guys saw TIV-1 out on the road, but it, you know, it was very simplistic. And the first year we were out, we got pulled over 17 times. <laughs> Now, I, I want to say this is, we, we had this electrical fire the first year out. I didn't, I, I was new to fabricating. So I didn't know you're supposed to tie down the batteries. So we hit this large bump, the battery shorted, the whole cable burnt up, there was smoke coming out of the dash. The first year out, there were no doors on the front. So you had to crawl back towards the, the, the escape doors. And of course you're crawling back towards this these batteries and the cables are on fire and they're burning up the Berber carpet that I got from Home Depot. And <laughs> you're crawling towards that and getting out. So the first year we got the problem fixed, but um, every time it would rain, the rear lights would short out. So that was also, I, I have to cough up that, you know, we got stopped a lot for that as well. And actually, another issue with the Berber carpet was that the vehicle leaks, right? And you got three, four guys living in this vehicle and we're, you know, hygienically challenged, of course. And so you get this smell that called the man stench. And this, this picture was actually taken from the last time the TIV was at um, ChaserCon. And this is a lady that stuck her head in. And <laughs> this rare moment where someone's reacting to man stench <laughs> is actually captured. So TIV-1, God bless its little heart, um, it was also a two-wheel drive vehicle. And so we were getting stuck every time we'd take a mud road, usually. It had a static shape. It had a shape that didn't move. So our clearance was about eight inches. So we were always getting hung up. You know, we were always getting stuck. And so the idea, of course, was to build TIV-2. And I, of course, <laughs> when I was here last, I, I showed these pictures of that beautiful Dodge truck being torn down into this. Dodge gave us that truck. It had leather seats. It had a DVD. <laughs> it, had a, it had a navigation system. And then that's what it was. <laughs> and so it was built back up into this, TIV-2. And TIV-2, you know, it had its issues, of course. But over the years, you're, you're constantly developing this tool to try and make it as perfect as possible for, in my mind, to get the perfect shot. So, also, another issue, besides the shirt, was that <laughs> we only did this mission, um, going to tornadoes, because we had been working with Dr. Josh Werman, and he was approving of the idea that we could drive into a tornado with um, the safety of his radar. So the first six years of our mission, of course, was under the safety of these, these, these radars that he had that were scanning the tornadoes and on the radio he was giving us the max wind speeds and we had a reasonable, you know, we, we felt like we could do that. Um, that we could actually do that mission under the safety of his radar, drive into these tornadoes. Of course, he gave me the shirt. Um, and then I found out later that the space program had a chimpanzee that they sent up first, called Ham. So I only got the joke 
after I took this picture and I was really happy about the shirt. I just wanted to show this because it was a really macho picture of Tim Marshall. Yeah, Tim Marshall is with Vortex 2 and Probe 14 has just dropped a pod and he is busily running towards his vehicle to get in, drive, and drop another pod. And that was another part of the IMAX film, of course, that I wanted to create or, 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 or portray was not only the, the, the beautiful images that exist in Tornado Alley, but of course, the scientists that were, were studying them. And of course, when Vortex 2 rolled around, that in my mind, of course, was the natural storyline, one of the natural storylines to portray in this, this IMAX film. And so now, I will hand it over to Brandon to talk about that crucial day in Goshen County. Well, I won't talk about too much of the setup on uh, Goshen County because I think Karen uh, last year wanted uh, a lot of the setup details on that day. But you know, obviously, it was kind of more of an isolated event, uh, upslope flow event, which obviously I don't get out to the high plains to chase a lot. So you know, I'm not the most knowledgeable person by playing upslope flow events. But you know, we we had been in a tornado drought in May of 2009. We'd basically gone from April 29th to Plainview Day. Uh, to this day without anything to show for. Um, you know, so it was towards the end of our season and we were kind of, you know, obviously wondering if, uh, you know, Sean was going to fire Matt and I after that year. So luckily, uh, this day popped up and uh, we were treated to a, a beautiful high base uh, photogenic tornado um, southwest of the Grange, Goshen County, Wyoming, um, which it was also really fascinating to be a part of because you know, with Vortex 2 on the storm, it was also the most heavily studied and documented tornado so far in history. And, uh, you know, with him being able to get an intercept, um, you know, that was, you know, some very crucial data. Uh, but you don't really need the dew points, um, obviously, on the high plains that you do, uh, you know, when you get out on the regular plains. I mean, just east of that area, you had nice backing winds, but you know, you got 73 over 56. Normally when you have a temperature dew point spread like that, if I was chasing out a witch storm, you know, obviously I'd want to go to an area where there's more moisture. Uh, but that storm pretty much tracked, you know, east, southeast along there. And uh, this is a pretty cool uh, radar picture uh, from that day. And obviously for some reason it's not gonna loop, but if you go to the Vortex 2 site, you can see all these beautiful images where you know, these supercell thunderstorms almost look like something, you know, you'd see with hurricanes. Um, you know, as this thing's moving east southeast and then the tornado, uh, obviously, you know, as it's uh, later in its life cycle, moves more southerly. But this was the radar image, probably pretty close to what we intercepted it. Um, you know, pretty classic supercell. Um, you know, and, and luckily we were able to get west of 85 there. I had a more detailed map in uh, Microsoft Streets and Trips, but it really wouldn't work with this PowerPoint presentation. So, you know, th there was a dirt road west of there uh, that went south, and, and luckily just in Wyoming with a rural area and few road options, you know, the storm was tracked over this road. We were able to head south on it, kind of line the tornado up, and uh, be able to get Tiv, uh, you know, right there in the southern end of it. And, uh, you know, there's a velocity image probably right around the time that Tib was getting in the southern end of that tornado. And then a short video clip, uh, we didn't have the same vantage point Tib had. Uh, they were south of the tornado. Uh, Matt and I kind of stayed back uh, further north in Doghouse, uh, Sean's follow vehicle, and it documented it from the north. And uh, you can uh, kind of see me in this. Okay, here's a. Uh, Pretty much some of the uh, specs of the tornado. It was ranked DF2, it was on the ground for about 25 minutes. Um, I never saw the actual data from TIP2, but I think the winds were right under 140 miles, miles per hour. I think I've heard 138.5, somewhere around there, uh, with a pressure drop right around 50 millibars. And this is pretty much what it looked like. Wow. Okay, we're going to stop here. Probably. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's gonna be done. It's gonna be done. Maybe even in between us, it's getting real close. Right. 
Stay here, we can't move. That's too strong for us. Stay here, it's gonna cross just to our south. Yeah, you got cars in your way. Oh, it's gonna, it's gonna cross God. right in front of us. Oh my God. Back up. It's coming back this back way. Up. Back up. Now, girl. Back up. No, you back up. I can't. I got a car behind me. Okay, I think you're good now. I think you're good now. You're All good right, now. we're good. Sorry, man. I just... Okay, okay. I was worried about this power lines coming down, too. It was, that was just too close for me. He said car, I think, yeah, two. Yeah, me too. So while um, Matt and Brandon were to the north, uh, of course, this is what was going on in the TIV. <laughs> um, earlier in the year, uh, we discovered a design flaw with the turret. We uh, were actually driving about 80 miles per hour, and we had about 40 mile per hour headwinds, and the turret actually popped out. It caught the wind, because the turret flap was open and we don't have AC in the vehicle, and so our AC is popping the turret open and facing it forward for AC. And so the turret actually popped up and wedged against the mast. So it was kind of embarrassing. Uh, we didn't really tell anybody. Um, we put the turret back, and I welded some little keepers on um, the interior. And of course, uh, Tim Samaras saw the keepers, and he said we should have bigger keepers. Um, but we rolled with it. <laughs> and so when all of a sudden that tornado, and this was the first time that I had seen a tornado with the condensation funnel all the way to the ground, forming right in front of us and coming right at us. Uh, when we started getting hit by those winds, the actual turret started jumping up and down rhythmically, like slamming against those keepers, you know? And in my mind, um, I was thinking the turret was gonna pop off, the IMAX camera was gonna fly out with the turret because they're attached, and the film in the camera of the shot we just got was gonna go bye-bye. And of course, my father owns the camera. And so I wedged myself underneath and tried to hold down the turret. Not that I was doing any good, but at least I was doing something at the time. Um, and at that moment, you know, what I was thinking about wasn't about, well, it was about losing the turret, but then how silly the moment is and how, in a way, <laughs> how, in a way, are recreating something um, where you were holding on for in your mind dear life inside of a tornado. Um, what do I have? Oh no, this, this comes later. Questions and concerns, we'll do Q&A afterwards. Um, but Brandon's gonna talk about um, some of the tornadoes and the setups that we had over the, the last two years. We had chased, you know, we missed the storm the day before up in northwest uh, South Dakota by Dupree uh, in that area. We weren't able to get up there in time. Uh, we chased further southwest in the Black Hills, but I remember we drove all night uh, to Sioux Falls and stayed the night there, got about three hours of sleep, and then got up and went and chased this a day. And, you know, this was, you know, pretty good event. We were, you know, Obviously, in the Wadena area, we were more in the uh, left front quadrant of this little jet street coming in, and there's pretty bit of some really favorable wind shear with this event. Um, you know, obviously, the low level winds were very intense, 
These are the 850 millibar winds, you know, you got some 50 knots in there. And then even lower than that, the uh, 925 winds were more back, and you can see in both those frames that, you know, there's plenty of low-level moisture feeding up into that area. And so some of the mesoanalysis parameters, usually when I'm putting a forecast together, days in advance, obviously I'm looking at the models. Uh, the day of the event, the mesoanalysis page becomes my best friend. And then when storms initiate, you know, I pretty much know where the good parameters are because I've been looking at this all day long. Uh, I pretty much toggle between just keeping up with the radar and looking at surface odds because, you know, the surface odds are usually pretty important. But you can see here you got some pretty good mixed layer cave instability axis coming up there through western Minnesota and back into the eastern portions of North Dakota with relatively little convective inhibition. And then you have these steep lap traits moving out in this pretty decent uh, low level instability is this zero to three kilometer cape. And I usually look at a lot of the lower level instability when I'm forecasting for tornadoes. And then obviously the, uh, the storm relative helicity, you know, I like to see those overlap. And you know, those two parameters, you know, the overall cape and the storm relative helicity uh, go into, you know, pretty much show you the EHI. And this can be misleading at times if you just strictly look at the EHI because a lot of times in the summer when you get these big cape events, obviously you'll get a lot of EHI. And then you'll look at the, uh, the shear, the low level shear, and then uh, you'll be rather disappointed. Um, so, but when you get the good shear and the instability, and particularly the lower level instability, um, you know, usually if storms stay rather isolated, you can have very good chase days. And this was a really good chase day for us. We just ventured north uh, about as Sioux Falls that day and kind of went east over into Minnesota. And on a lot of these outbreak days when you're going to have fast storm motions, uh, and I've picked a target, I, I try to set up more on the northern side because it's always easier to play a little bit north and head south and pick off storms. Obviously, if the storm of the day is 200 miles down to the south, more than likely you're not going to catch it. But that keeps kind of a lot of the storms in play because if you forecast a little too far north, you know, with storms moving up your way, it's easy to adjust. And, you know, if, if you're south of something and it's moving northeast of 40, more than likely you're never going to catch it. But that's pretty much the general setup that day. And we originally got on this first tornado, uh, the multi-vortex tornado that Sean got. Um, you know, the multi-vortex in, in Tornado Alley, there was a north-south road here, uh, where he was shooting to the southwest. And then we kind of played tag team with Reed up in this area. Um, then we went further north and kind of crossed right ahead Obviously, we lost visualization of this tornado, uh, but we cut east somewhere up in this area and was able to get back out ahead of the storm in time, uh, just in the nick of the time. And that was the tornado that crossed behind the tip, uh, ripping off tree branches um, in Tornado Alley. And then another storm intensified on the southern flank of that storm. This storm was pretty much done, so we dropped it and went south of the and saw this tornado forming and we followed up a highway east of Wadena and came into town from the east. And, you know, unfortunately the EF4 hit, hit Wadena there. Um, but obviously the town, the tornado going through town, even though it was largely rain wrapped, um, that was also in Tornado Alley. So the first tornado we caught, uh, EF4 with peak winds estimated around 175 miles per hour. The time of occurrence was 3.45 to 4.45 p.m. So this was a long track tornado. It was on the ground for about an hour. Um, 39 mile track, so the storm was moving about 40 miles an hour. And we had a really good road network uh, in that part of Minnesota. Um, I was kind of worried we'd maybe get a little too far north or too far east, get into a lot of trees that would really obscure our view. But really, for some reason, this day really worked out. And then the second tornado was a Wadena tornado. It was also an EF4 tornado. Uh, winds were estimated around 170 according to the information on the National Weather Service page in that area. Uh, time of occurrence there wasn't as long as a tornado. Uh, it was on the ground from 5 to 5.18 p.m. with about a duration of 18 minutes. We pretty much solved most of the life cycle of that tornado until it left the town of Wadena, and that's when we lost it. But I don't think it tracked too far northeast of town before it occluded and dissipated. Uh, they had a track of about 10 miles. And then here's some video from that day. Four! Four vortices! 
four vortices. Wow! That's a satellite tornado. A satellite. You guys, keep going. I have no shot. Hello on now. That's a satellite tornado. It's rotating a large. It's rotating around the backside of that large wedge. Sorry. Oh, it's, it's good. It's already okay, gone. Yeah, you're good. That's a tornado. A big one. Yeah, I was actually scared that day. I was actually, we were, um, <laughs> uh, we, we first filmed that, uh, the, the vortices, uh, those vortices dancing around. Then, then we were tracking with that tornado, got ahead of it, and um, there's that moment where I think they were moving about 50 miles an hour that day. Yeah, they were moving quite quick, and um, we were just to the north of, of that, that tornado that you see Mark, and he's, he's very joyous as it's passing behind us. I, I wasn't so joyous before that because we were kind of going like, let me see this pointer device. How did you do that? <laughs> this one? Oh, the middle button, yeah. All right, so the tornado I think had a kind of a north, northeast track. Yeah. yeah. And we were kind of going like this. And that tornado was going like this, and we were going like this, and, and <laughs> It was getting bigger, and, and, and there were a lot of trees, and I didn't know if, if Brandon was really seeing that it was, we were on like a collision course. So, um, of course, I'm using my um, adrenaline husky voice that um, I, I get involved with. And um, I'm yelling at him to get in front of it, um, or, or drive faster. And um, this thing is just coming right up behind us, and we just get out of the way. In fact, there's this moment where Trees are dominoing behind us as, I mean, just maybe 50 feet off the rear of the tip. So if we're 75 feet slower far back behind, then we're running into these trees that are dominoing behind us. Um, for me, um, I, I, I actually want to get into a stronger tornado. I want, I want to do a sequel. I want to, and this might be an impossibility, but I want to get to a larger circulation and film straight up. I would think it would be really cool to see what that could look like. I mean, but of course, you know, we're talking about the perfect tornado, we're talking about a stronger tornado because you're looking for a wider circulation. But in my mind, I, I want to, for this spring, um, possibly chase with some radar trucks, go back to Josh Worman and work with him and instrument our vehicle again with his instruments. and. With his guidance, um, retrofit the tip, put more spikes and stuff. You can never have enough spikes, so spikes really work. Um, and get into a wider circulation where we could film upward. And I know you guys just, it never happened, never happened. But you know, we're gonna try that. Um, so that when we encounter a tornado like the one that went through Wadena, and if there's not too much debris being picked up by that tornado, to, to get that perspective, to not only film it coming at us, but to film straight up. And Brandon's going to talk about another case study. Is there a way to skip forward on that at all to the next slide? Okay. Uh, the next two events are going to be uh, some stuff we chased this past season that will more likely end up in Sean's sequel to Tornado Alley. Uh, obviously, you had the big, big tornado outbreak on April the 27th, 2011, and you know this may be the biggest outbreak that I see in my lifetime. I mean, I think this is, you know, pretty similar to the super outbreak of '74. There are so many large perimeters over a large area, and these storms just continually, continually produce tornadoes, uh, even though a lot of them are spaced pretty close together. There are just so many good parameters or fuel in a sense for these storms that, you know, that they just kept producing tornadoes. And, and, and we picked a, a highway in eastern Minnesota, or I'm sorry, we picked a highway in eastern Mississippi uh, up by Macon that day and just decided we were gonna drop south, push storm after storm. And we encountered several supercells that day. Um, 
saw a tornado out by Macon, and then our big one was down by Enterprise. But it seems like all these storms as they're crossing over the highway. I didn't want to venture into Alabama too much because I knew that the terrain became more of an issue. I mean, if Mississippi's bad enough with trees, um, you know, obviously going into western Alabama, um, it, it looked like there was more forested areas. Uh, so it was even more of a challenge. So we just picked the highway in eastern Mississippi that day, had several supercells cross over, and they were in the process of, you know, recycling. They'd have to, like the Philadelphia tornado to the west, I guess we uh, met up with that by Macon, but the storm that went on to produce the uh, Tuscaloosa and Birmingham tornado crossed over us, and yeah, it probably wasn't too much longer before uh, that tornado was on the ground, but you know, on these fast moving days, uh, like I was saying with the Wadena, you know, kind of my plan of attack is to kind of set up north uh, the area that looks good, and that, that way you kind of keep more storms and, and favorable, because you know, obviously when you got storms racing as fast as they are were that day, you're only gonna have a limited window of opportunity to you know, not only view each storm, but there's no way to keep up with storms that day in that terrain, it's just, just too difficult. Uh, so you had a really powerful uh, jet stream coming in there and uh, a lot of dynamics with this system. It was a pretty broad trough, but a really intense one, uh, really intense wind speeds. Uh, looking at the lower level, lower levels, and you know, in terms of saving time, I didn't have time to you know put all the mandatory levels in there, so there's no upper level or no 700 uh, millibar charts in here. But obviously, you see this moisture again, and you see this really strong low-level wind field like you did on the Wadena day. Uh, not necessarily as back, but I've learned, you know, obviously the chasing from the high plains to the central plains to the southeast, uh, there's kind of different ingredients that'll make up these severe weather events. Uh, I'm not a fan of southwest flow uh, at low levels, but obviously since you got this big body of water southwest of Mississippi and Alabama, you know, obviously when you get east, you're not gonna have a lot of dry air entrainment and, and it's gonna pan out more times than not out there. Um, and then here's the 925 millibar winds. Again, really, really strong low level winds. There's even a you know, 55 uh, knot wind bar there in central Alabama, and you got adequate moisture. Um, you have a pretty large cape, uh, not extremely high cape, but you had a, a big, instead of having a narrow axis of cape, you had you know, instability over a pretty broad area. So these storms you know, could continue and continue and continue, and they weren't gonna just move over an instability axis. Obviously that far east, you know, you're not gonna see a lot of the steep lapse rates, a lot of the dry lines don't make that far east, but you have, you know, the really good low level instability, you know, down there in that lowest, you know, three kilometers, down there close to the surface, uh, where those parcels can be lifted up, you know, pretty close down to the ground. And then you have really extreme, really extreme uh, low level wind shear for that day. This is a zero to one uh, kilometer. And then the EHI, you know, obviously very impressive EHI parameters over a pretty broad area. All these storms are pretty much tracking northeast uh, through that favorable area. And, you know, this is at 22Z, so as the evening progressed, you know, this kind of got sandwiched off to the east. And, you know, then, then you saw tornadoes later on further into Georgia and, and even up into the Carolinas and even through some of the northeast. But even way up in the northeast, you know, already at that hour, you, you got some pretty decent. Uh, EHI values there, and uh, yeah, this is probably pretty close to the time frame of the Enterprise tornado. Um, that was kind of our gem of the day uh, that we were able to see. Um, intercepted on this highway, uh, right where the east-west road, I forget that highway there, but um, goes east, there's a highway that goes to Enterprise here and then it goes off into the east here. Uh, so we set up right here, so this is, you know, a few minutes before it came through. Um, but this is from the uh, Brandon uh, Mississippi radar um, out of the Jackson area. You can see the velocity couplet, and here's this road. So we were set up right at that intersection there, kind of on the northeast side, and we kind of watched it just cross to the south of us. Uh, this Enterprise tornado, it was a very long track tornado, almost like the one prior to the Wadena. It was another EF4 with winds estimated around 175 miles per hour. Uh, when we encountered it, it was more around EF3 stream. I put that down there. Um, time of occurrence was around 5.42 to PM to 7.13, so it was about an hour and 13 minutes on the ground. Uh, 65 mile track in Mississippi. I think it went into Alabama for a little bit, um, but it dissipated pretty quickly after it got 
in Alabama. And then here's the video of crossing. Thank you. And really for the sake of time, uh, you know, I think we got about 10 minutes left here. Um, is there a way to jump to the next slide? Okay. Uh, I thought I put all the tornadoes in there from June 20th. I'll go through this date real quick. Uh, this was another successful day uh, that we had in 2011. And then Sean can talk to you about, you know, how those shots will uh, more than likely be implemented into the sequel. Um, this was a really interesting setup here. You know, you almost got this closed low full core type setup, which was more like the uh, uh, storm that started early in the day back out by Hill City, Kansas, that produced uh, multiple numbers of tornadoes there um, under that upper low there. And typically I'm not a fan of southern, you know, uh, uh, flow 500 millibar layer, 700 millibar layer out of the south, but obviously when you have a warm front and like we did this day, and you have these winds back more out of the east, it's pretty much taking the favorable parameters we're used to seeing and just kind of rotating them to the east about 45 degrees. So as long as you got the shear and the moisture, obviously when these storms come up north and you know interact with the shear of this warm front, um, they're pretty much probably going to produce tornadoes as did uh, the storms these days. And then obviously you even got more back winds lower at uh, 925 millibars. But obviously you got a thick moisture layer there. Uh, Pretty decent instability there with, with little convective inhibition uh, right there over the portion of Nebraska. Uh, pretty much all these images I've been showing you are you know, around the 22Z time frame. So right around the time the storms really didn't get going. So you really see more or less uh, what the storm relative parameters were. Here you, you have the steep low level lap traits again coming in and you know, right next to and adjacent to a lot of that really low level uh, instability down there in the lowest three kilometers of the atmosphere. And then you have pretty decent low level shear, um, pretty good zero to one kilometer storm relative velocity values there uh, through eastern Nebraska. And we started the day in Grand Island, and you know, probably we would have gone west to the earlier activity if we wouldn't have jogged up to uh, Columbus, Nebraska that day. We kind of went northeast, kind of set up out ahead of everything, and that was a little too far northeast, so we drop back down, you know, later in the day once we had a better idea of exactly where everything was going to initiate. It was, it, it was really a challenge not to, you know, go west because, you know, you're seeing these reports about these tornadoes in Kansas, tornado after tornado after tornado. Um, but we kind of had a feeling that, you know, later in the day, something further southeast was going to fire, and it eventually did. Uh, but we were watching tornado reports out to the west. Obviously, you have real favorable UHI values that day, which favored tornadoes. Uh, the first tornado we encountered was near Hampton. We'd actually come south here and saw it back in the rain here. It was rather rain-wrapped tornado. It started down here south of uh, Interstate 80 and came across. And we set up right about here. And as this thing's coming up, you know, it looks like it was gonna, you know, we we're gonna get an intercept. Well, as we were deploying, 
in the tip, we kind of jumped the gun maybe a little bit too early. Uh, it took a right turn and obviously passed off to our east. Uh, but once this got off to the north of the highway, you know, we could see the other four funnel forming down off to the southeast. Uh, so we went and got over on the newer developed tornado. The Hampton, Nebraska tornado was a DF2. Winds were estimated around 125 miles per hour. Uh, time of occurrence was 525 to 545 p.m. with a duration of about 20 minutes. Uh, so it had about a nine and a half mile track uh, on that first tornado we had a close encounter with. The second tornado was formed off to our southeast as the uh, other tornado was still on the ground back to our northwest. Uh, but it was a much more photogenic tornado. So we went off east and we had the close encounter where Tib went east here and I was running along the ditch probably right around there. <laughs> and, uh, we were able to see this tornado for a while going up to the north, but you know we've had so many instances in the past where we get on these dirt roads and you know had a feeling that maybe this tornado would produce more tornadoes. It was going to be a cyclical storm, so we didn't want to lose it on the dirt roads. Even though it was probably moving slow enough, we could have taken one of these roads. A lot of these roads were you know seeing uh, dirt roads out here, uh, but we made the choice to go over to York and then head north. Uh, try to set up out ahead of the storm again for maybe something that would be forming later on uh, with the storm's life cycle. Uh, so we got two close encounters with that, and then this is a radar image, you know, uh, basically the donut hole when the tornado is on the ground here. Um, coming up towards the highway uh, south, this is probably right around the time or pretty close that it tipped over the railroad cars down there on the railroad track. Um, and that tornado was also a duration of 20 minutes. It was a little bit stronger, but it was still an EF2 with estimated winds of 130 miles per hour. On the ground from 5.40 to 6 p.m. with a 15 mile per hour track. So it seems like maybe the storm picked up a little bit of speed uh, since the previous tornado, you know, obviously it was a 20 minute duration and it only had a nine and a half mile track. And then the last tornado we saw this day, we never really got, we were coming up this highway, so we never really got a close encounter until about here. And we were going to take this dirt road north and try to get an intercept, but obviously it had occluded and, and died out off there to our west. But this one was a little bit more of a stout tornado. Um, and you can see here the supercell does look as organized. Um, this was the last tornado before it moved further north in the more stable air at the lower levels. And basically the storm just um, you know, kept going, but uh, became elevated with time and didn't produce any more tornadoes. So this tornado was an EF3 with max winds of 140 miles per hour. It was on the ground for you know about 18 minutes, so 20 minute time frames for tornadoes were pretty common that day with that storm. On the ground from 6.02 p.m. to 6.20 p.m. for nine and a half mile track, and then this is some of the video from that day. It's gonna pass to our east. It's gonna pass to our east. It's gonna pass to our east. Uh, watch the power line. Past our east. You could open your door probably. See what it does to these rail cars. Wow, listen to it. It's insane. Oh my god. Oh my god. That thing oh. is incredible. Oh, here go the train cars. Thank you, our perfect position right there. Yeah, I didn't know that Brandon had gotten out of the vehicle. <laughs> that was a surprise because, you know, we had stopped because it looked a little aggressive. We weren't chasing with radar. And of course, I've got kids and, you know, and I want to get back to my family. And it, you know, it looked kind of aggressive. Of course, that was visually that it was picking up a lot of dust. So it looked more aggressive than it actually was. Um, so when it was coming across the train tracks, you know, we were stopped. And that's when Brandon got the idea to jump out and start running at it. <laughs> and it visually started to weaken. So I was yelling at Marcus to drive for it, go towards it. So that's why you see that perspective of the tip 
um, being filmed by Brandon. And, and, and in my IMAX shot, it's quite kind of cool because we're driving towards the tornado as it's coming up the road. And here's Brandon running faster than I thought he could ever run. <laughs> Just running. And he's in my IMAX shot. It's kind of cool. And, and then, of course, when we get close to the tornado, we see those grain silos starting to you know, go up around us. And all that circulation starts to come over us. And then and we stop, right? Um, but yeah, that, that, those, those last um, tornadoes, it's, it's stuff that we got in IMAX um, and in 3D. Um, and this is all footage that will one day work itself into Tornado Alley 2. So at this point, I'm going to open it up to any questions or concerns, if we have time. Who's the first brave soul in the striped shirt? What's your uh, gas mileage today? <laughs> A gas mileage question? What? Um, Pound per pound, the Tiv gets what a Prius gets. <laughs> we get 10 miles to the gallon. We weigh 14,000 pounds, though. Uh, we have a 92-gallon uh, tank. We have 14, you know, so we, we have a range of you know, 800 miles. I don't know. We've never run out of gas. You know, we fill up in the morning, and then that's it. Another question? No? Right here? It's not everybody's mind. What's the status of TIB 3? It's all up here. It's on another paper napkin with another like fast food order on it, right? <laughs> now, um, TIB 3, you know, I, I still don't think that we've, we've really perfected, you know, the vehicle, um, the, the, that tool. And in my mind, you know, having a vehicle that is half the weight of TIB um, 2 and being a full off-roading platform, you know, you see those, those Baja 500 races? You see, you know, where they're driving through the desert going 100 miles an hour? That looks kind of fun. So I, I want to take one of those platforms and then go um, a smaller cab, very light, still have those pounds that go down. And then really, if you can get a vehicle off-road, then you're putting yourself in a position where you can really put the use of spikes into the ground. And those spikes really help. And so, you know, having like eight spikes maybe? to anchor yourself and being extremely light. And you know, you, you chase in you know, uh, western Texas, western Oklahoma, and you, you get these ranch areas, you know, the hundreds of thousands of acres of ranches, and there's no way to get to them. And it'd be fun to, I'm not saying busting through fences, <laughs> but taking roads that you have access to, to, and of course, you know, you get those mud slick roads and wherever, and, It'd be nice to really have the confidence to you know, take those roads. And that, that's what I would like to, that's what TIB 2 was supposed to do. But it was still too heavy. Um, and so that's what I'd like to do. And then I'd like, to, well, I won't go into it. Um, What's the plan now that uh, Storm Chasers is the, uh, the question is the plan now that Storm Chasers is canceled. Um, yeah, well, I guess some of you guys are relieved, right? You don't have to watch us, you know, doing our thing on the road. Um, uh, it's kind of a, in a way, it's kind of a relief um, that there's the pressure out there to be out there for two and a half months straight. And, you know, you're always, you know, there's always a camera there and you're always, it's just, it, let's just say it'd be nice to go back out there without all the cameras and, and, and kind of have, you know, fun again. Um, so we'll see what happens this spring. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know. But there are certain things maybe in the works. Huh? Did you learn anything from the Mythbusters? Did I learn anything from the Mythbusters? <laughs> Going back to, well, yeah, there was the door problem. But the spikes really work, um, even though that really wasn't a fair test. I mean, that's a great test in case we're behind the 747 again. <laughs> And we've deployed perfectly. And we're getting the headwinds just perfect. I mean, we've never had a perfect intercept. I mean, we've always seemed to take the strongest winds broadside. And of course, we have a larger uh, area exposed. And you're getting more forcing because you're, you know, you, you've got more mass. Surface area is being pushed against. Um, but yeah, spikes really are cool. And if you had eight of them, you'd really stick. <laughs> And then have them so that they're not using the vehicle to push down, but they're, they're actually working against each other, pushing off of each other. So, yeah, spikes. I love spikes. And it's nothing to do with, you know, 
phallic stuff. Anyway, right there. <laughs> Oh, bu buying the farm? I bought the farm. We just moved to Sonoma. We have a little farm now. Um, yeah, of course, you know, you, chasing these storms, you always want to be in control. Um, you, you want to pick the time and the place where you are going to encounter these tornadoes. But of course, you're chasing from in front of these tornadoes. And as they intensify, um, there was the Stuttgart um, incident where we had this tornado that had 240 mile per hour winds um, coming down the road going 60 miles per hour and we were in the inflow trying to outrace it. It was coming right down the road. And we were getting headwinds, inflow of about 70, 80 miles per hour winds. It was carrying rain around so the visibility dropped to maybe you know, 70 feet. So we're going 45 miles per hour and the tornado is going 60 and it's getting bigger and bigger behind you. And yeah, at that time you've lost control of the situation. And at that time I get this like this, this pressure on the back of my neck, you know, this pressure. You know when they say like death perched on your, I think that's what they're talking about. Death, what perched there. So yeah, at night when you've got a tornado that's chasing you, that's awful, I hate it. And lightning. Um, what inspired you to go look up in the What, what was that again? <laughs> what inspired you to go look up in the Well, that's the new idea. What inspired me to look up? Uh, for Tornado Alley, uh, it was to get the shot of it coming at us and impacting us. Um, so what do you do after that, right? Look up. <laughs> and that's another thing is that, you know, there was a huge learning curve with this process, you know, and, and getting comfortable with going into tornadoes. And, and if you're only focused on one shot, that's all you're going to get. And that's what we were getting. You know, we were in this mode of getting the one shot. And then all of a sudden the tornado passes you, and what do you do? You're all, well, okay, you know, you, you, you've... You've set yourself up for not maximizing you know, the chase and to go after it. And it's just been recently that we've really been in the mindset of, okay, the tornado, you know, we're, we know what we're going to do next. 